Are there any changes to the agenda? Hearing none, we'll make a motion to, uh, I don't think I need a motion for that, do I? No. Yes, I do. <laughs> Is there a motion to adopt the agenda? Thank you, John. Second. Thank you, Brian. All in favor of adopting the agenda, say aye. Okay. Raise your hand if you're on Zoom. Thank you. Okay, the agenda is adopted. So at this time, we have an opportunity for public comment. We have two opportunities, one at the beginning of the meeting and one at the end of the meeting. Um, we ask that you identify yourself and your town. Um, and we also ask that you try to limit yourself to two with a maximum of three minutes. Lara, I'm going to ask if you'll do the timing. Lara will give you all a 30 second warning that your time is closing out. Um, we also ask that uh, order and decorum be observed by all persons present. And our practice is that if you've spoken once and wish to speak again, we let all other folks um, go ahead of you so that everyone has a chance at uh, public comment time. Uh, is there anyone uh, who would like to make a public comment? Yes. Thank you. Hi, I'm Patty Kuzbek. I'm from Um, I want to open with the fact that I have deep gratitude and respect for every good teacher my child has had in this district and appreciate Sherry's trying to handle this situation when I brought it to her. I would like to express my concern and frustrations with Alma and the adherence to the grade reporting practices and procedures in this district. In the school handbook, it reads, quote, timely and accurate student progress reporting is important for students and family and staff. Specific means of reporting are then listed. For instance, teachers post scores in Alma on a timely basis, which is said to mean, quote, as reasonably possible, but by three weeks after the assignment was turned in. Also, teacher post summative assignments in Alma at least five days before they are due, which begs the question, if a student does not know how they did on a formative, how should they prepare for a summative? My second point and my favorite is, quote, additional communication from families will occur for any student earning um, an NC during the semester. Notification may be via phone, email, or conference. Now, I can tell you from personal experience, this does not happen. Our child struggled last year, unfortunately, and did receive some NCs for a variety of reasons. We pursued these matters, they, they became to know they became known to us, but not once did a teacher reach out to us. As another example of our struggles with the Alma system, an assignment near end of year was marked as received, but no grade ever appeared. This is the one I talked to you personally about, Sherry, and I appreciate everything you did. 30 seconds. I reached out by, well, I'm gonna go fast then. I reached out by email twice to the teacher by year end to question the grade and never received a response. My child ended up with a zero on a summative. As school year finished, I could not reach the teacher or principal. I contacted Sherry Sweeney, who said I had to follow channels. So she got me in touch with Garen, who I spoke with directly, and he said he would handle it. The grade remained a zero. Garen was no longer available to contact. Sherry apologized and said she appreciated me going through the channels and would hope things would improve going forward. When I responded that I did not think my child should take one for the district and that I wanted the zero removed from her record or I would need to take next steps, suddenly the zero would remove with the help of the interim principal who knew nothing really about the matter. We had a similar experience with another teacher earlier in the year. She marked an assignment and all that has not turned in, but remembered it when reminded of the email discussion we had had surrounding it. Suddenly my child, suddenly my child got an A on that assignment. Seemed improbable. And finally, there was one teacher who simply never returned any communication we sent regarding assignments and rarely put in a grade before the three week window. This is a system failure and I find it hard to tell my child, you have to live to be graded by a system that is unclear, inconsistent and not adhered to evenly, timely and fairly and has a different standard of adherence for staff versus their students. I have brought this concern up the chain as instructed. I have discussed it with counselors a previous vice principal and a previous principal who proved well aware of these failures without satisfaction or resolution. I just now bring it to the board. Thank you. Thank you, Patty. <laughs> is there anyone else who would like to speak at this time? Yes. Hi there. Um, my name is Tamine Peters and I'm the parent of, and I live in Woodstock. 
Um, and I'm a parent of a three-year-old who just started pre-K in the school district. I am so encouraged by and grateful for this group's open-mindedness to explore a phone-free bell-to-bell policy. Although my daughter was quite young, concerns about the detrimental effects of smartphones and social media on young people's mental health are already weighing on the hearts and minds of parents, even the youngest children in the district, as we look ahead to their futures. Being able to come together as a community around this issue to protect young people's well-being would be such a gift to parents, the young people themselves, and anyone who cares for them. Teams in districts where similar policies have been implemented have shared remarkable feedback. I'd love to highlight just a few quick examples. Students out of school in Iowa recently shared, quote, I think my attention has kind of skyrocketed. Another student in the high school shared, the phone ban has helped me to find new ways to cope through reading and writing. And some anecdotal feedback from participating schools in Vermont includes a librarian who showed that more children were spending time in the library and checking out books. Our principal shared that a student stated that she felt like she could breathe again. And a parent relayed that their child was enjoying school lunch because children were talking to each other rather than spending time mm -hmm. on their phones. Other positive benefits that districts have reported experiencing are outlined on page seven of the Phone Free Schools Administrator Toolkit, which I believe um, some of you have been provided. Um, if you'd like to take a look when you have the opportunity. Um, thank you so much for your consideration of this important issue and for all that you do. Thank you, Janine. <laughs> Anybody else? Yes. So um, I had sent, or Carrie, you have a PowerPoint that was sent. Sherry has it. Can you um, introduce yourself? Yeah. So my name is Kelly Kane. I have a child at uh, Woodstock High School. She's in 10th grade. And um, I just wanted to go through this quick PowerPoint phone preschool that Mountain Views. Um, and are you going to share it? Yep. Um, so this is credit for this is given to Molly Tripp and Gaines from So, um, and it's just a quick overview of some of the benefits of um, going home free. So I'm just going to read from the uh, PowerPoint. If you could go to the next slide. Who and why? Who are we? A group of Woodstock area caregivers and community members who have read this research, seen the effects of funds in schools, and want to change. Why phone free, improved academic performance, better mental health, fewer distractions, less bullying, development of social skills, and mountain views for graduate attributes. What is our mission to provide youth the freedom to excel academically and develop socially without the distractions, pressures, and harms of phones and social media during the school day? Who else is phone free? 2018, Fran, France bans phones and schools for kids under 15. 2021, China bans phones and schools for all grades. 2023, England bans schools, uh, phones and schools for all grades. 2023, UN Global Education Monitoring Report made a worldwide recommendation to remove phones from classrooms to improve learning and decrease exposure of uh, cyberbullying. 2024, at least 11 states have passed laws or enacted policies that ban or restrict students' use of cell phones in schools statewide or recommend local districts enact their own bans or restrictive policies according to an Education Week analysis. How do phones interfere with academic and social emotional learning? Is that the timer? Yeah. Okay. So um, the bottom line with phones as a teacher who teaches adults. I feel like my fantasy is that teachers would not only be able to, you know, spend time on teaching, but also take their attention away from having to manage phones in the classroom. Um, also, as a parent of two females, um, the effect has been pretty dramatic as to um, their focus, um, and I would say their mental well-being. Um, I think the research is clear on this, and I'm sure all of us know some of that research. Um, also, I think um, there's a great book called The Anxious Generation by Jonathan Haidt that outlines all of the uh, research. So I hope you guys will consider it, and thank you for taking, letting me take the time to speak today. Thank you, Kelly. Yeah. Is there anybody else? Yes. 
Uh, hello, my name is Stone Riegler. I live in Thetford, Vermont, and I'm a ninth grader. Um, so Thetford, just recently in 2024, this summer, we enacted a phone free school policy using the Yonder pouches. Uh, before this policy, there was great distress in classrooms. Teachers couldn't control students. Students were on their phones constantly. It was almost a game to see if I could stay in class for the however long class is, I get my phone for that precious three or four minutes after class to scroll on TikTok or check their feed or whatever, whatever. Uh, people during that time were on their phones during lunch or and everything. They weren't socializing as much as they used to. They, they just didn't talk to each other. Uh, during the summer, there was certainly a lot of grumbling from students and parents about how this would affect everything. But now that it's in action, it's really good. And I think it's been positive. It's a really good change. It's helped everyone. It's helped students become more focused. Teachers have said this, and it's obvious they're more focused, they're interacting more, they're uh, discussing more. Students who didn't actually in, uh, interact in class discussions are interacting more, they're talking to each other, they're doing things. Um, there's more communication within teachers and students, and students are talking to each other and being more social, and instead of using their phones to text someone, they're just telling them. Uh, that's um, number one and number two. Number three is that um, it feels like a happier and more uh, carefree environment without the phones. It feels like less pressure, less anxiousness, less uh, anxiety is surrounding them. Uh, students learn how to deal with boredom, especially understanding how to like deal with it, especially reading, drawing, writing. It's helped them cope with it. I've seen this personally. Um, number five is they're instead of texting someone with um to ask what they're doing, they're actively finding them to talk to them. Uh, thank you for this opportunity. I just think that it's a really good policy and that you guys should enact it. It helps the benefit of students, teachers in the entire district. It boosts grades and it declines social anxiety and depression. Yeah. <laughs> Would anyone else like to speak? I like to speak. Yes. <laughs> um, I'm actually here to talk about something other than the phone free school policy, but I'm 100% supportive. <laughs> and I'm so grateful for uh, all the work that you put in that. Um, I came to the board meeting last May, um, and I came to that board meeting because I was concerned. The Unified Arts teachers had been asked to look at their schedules and to figure out how they were going to reduce their unified arts contact time with students in K through six. And this was concerning to me because, and, and to other parents, because we know that the unified arts programs provide um, a lot of benefits for kids, uh, including supporting math and literacy, social emotional learning, um, and also just a reason to be inspired to come to class. And it was concerning also because they were being asked to reduce their contact time in order to increase the amount of time in their schedule to apply towards literacy and math. So um, I know that there was a report that came out um, with the board meeting minutes today that was in defense of the proficiency goal and addressed some of the issues that have been raised, what has happened to science and social studies in our K through six student schedules, what is going to happen to unified arts in our um, students K through six schedules as the um, district type tries to find time, um, more time in the schedule for reading. And I really uh, applaud and celebrate uh, a lot of the, the good progress that was reported in that report. I'm glad to see that some teachers are being uh, encouraged to bring science back into the program. I'm glad to see that there are some improvements um, made across our reading goals. But I was concerned to see that there was a justification still in that document for how time and money were going to be allocated. And so when we think about all of the stakeholder process that went through to design these proficiency goals, I do not think that we're standing up here and saying that we do not believe that every child in the district should have an opportunity to be uh, proficient in math or reading. But I think we're standing up here and asking, is the path to implementation one that we're willing to uh, embark on as a district? And from my perspective, this really is an opportunity to go back to your stakeholders and ask, 
are we willing to sacrifice and divide our time and our schedule uh, in order to uh, achieve the literacy goal? And how can we look at STEM art and music as part of the path to achieving that literacy goal? So I challenge this board as you are faced with budget cuts and also are thinking about time with time and schedule and program numbers to remember that arts, music, and STEM are equity. There is lots of data that demonstrates how um, socially disadvantaged students have greater retention rates in school, uh, less absenteeism when they're doing those to the arts, and um, then they have higher um, outcomes, so better SAT scores, they're more likely to complete college. Um, Elizabeth, we've exceeded the time limit. Thank you. So I'm really just asking that this is another time for the board and the district to re-engage with your stakeholders on some of these choices that are really going to affect um, my beliefs and outcomes. Thank you. Anybody else? All right, then we'll move into the next part of the meeting. Thank you very much, everybody, for your thoughts and comments and suggestions. Um, first is the superintendent's report. Thanks, Karen. Welcome, Dr. Shannon. Good to see you. Hi, great to see you. Um, so there's a, a summary of some of the activities and things that we've been working over in August. Just want to highlight a few and then talk about something that most recently happened that I think should be part of our conversation tonight. So. First, we had a great opening, lots of excitement and energy. Carrie was there when faculty and staff first returned, gave us a really positive orientation as we began our school year. In mid-August, I was able to participate in training on our high and low ropes course with some of our teachers, administrators, and paraeducators. It was a great time. Uh, I did struggle, as others could witness, but it was really great opportunity, and I know our Prosper Valley students have really accessed that significantly, and I'm optimistic that other schools and grades will also use our high and low ropes course. Um, I also I think it's really important to note that we had onboarding for our new faculty and staff. Uh, for faculty, we had 15 new faculty teachers, and we met at Prosper Valley. It's an opportunity to talk about our primary documents, our portrait of a graduate, strategic plan, and the work of the district. Um, and then um, finally, we had our opening day meeting where we introduced all our new faculty and staff, and we also had a really important pre uh, presentation from the director of the Human Rights Commission, looking at the um, passing, passing harassment, hazing, and bullying policy, HHB, as well as microaggressions and bystander intervention. It was a two-hour presentation, very dynamic. Our faculty was very involved. Um, that will be followed up with a survey to all faculty and staff around what are other topics that the Human Rights Commission can bring to us. Um, they heart and the director over the next three years. So that was a really good exchange. Um, the piece that it wasn't and didn't make our report that I think is really important, uh, especially in lieu of what happened in Georgia last week. So one of the roles of the superintendent is to maintain and update our emergency uh, operations plan. That's a document that's well over 200 pages and refers to every element of an emergency that we as administrators need to be aware of, contact information, phone numbers. Um, one piece that came out of that review, and it took me two days to get through it, and just updating names and numbers was our ability for faculty and staff to communicate to each other and for us to communicate to uh, families in the event of an emergency. Um, and reviewing the incident of last week and tragic, and we continue to say the tragedy, the piece that I took away from that was interesting for me was the ability of faculty and staff to communicate when a lockdown was needed immediately. And it's called it's called panic button. They had lanyards on the teachers, and so they were able to, as a faculty or staff member, immediately call in a lockdown and communicate to law enforcement. Really, really allow people to get to the location uh, as quickly as possible. Uh, spoke with RAF uh, on the end of the day Friday and Jim, and so we're looking at opportunities where that can happen. We have a little bit more SR money that we need to spend by the end of the month, um, hoping that could be a way, but really empowering our faculty and staff to communicate quickly and to get that information to law enforcement as quickly as possible. So I just wanted the board to be aware that we do update our emergency operations plan 
yearly. That document is used for each emergency plan for each campus, and our principals are in charge of that. But communication is an issue that we, um, you know, we have buildings that don't have uh, a cell phone service. We have buildings that have cinder block walls that make it really hard for our systems to work. So um, it's something that Jim and Rath and I are really attending to, and hopefully in the next few weeks can report on. But um, it's really it's part of what we have to work in. So, uh, has a question or a comment? Yeah, thanks for yeah, bringing, that up, bringing Sherry. that up, Sherry. I had, uh, I'm getting a little echo. Oh, brilliant, thank you. Um, uh, I had also taken that piece of information and I was going to bring it to the discussion tonight. So, I really appreciate that you've already, you're already on the ball aware of these systems. I can tell you that emergency departments use them um, specifically for that reason, not only to alert other staff, but also to alert law enforcement, um, being able to identify exactly where and also that. Um, cross staff communication is really important. I know like down in the cafeteria, they don't always hear the PA system um, and how important that is not only for staff to know, but then they can lock down within their rooms. So they're protecting students, um, colleagues, and when law enforcement arrives on scene, they have almost a near pinpoint location as to where um, they need to respond to. And so this is, I, I can't support this idea enough and let me know how I can um, help this idea move forward because I think this is critical given our current campus situation, um, not only in that we don't have a single entry point, but also the the inability to communicate across the campus. Um, so yes, I, I, I highly tout this technology and I've used it myself and it's brilliant. Thank you, Anna. Thank you. Any other board members have a comment? All right, then we'll move into the uh, RAF's uh, report um, from the Director of Technology and Innovation. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Raphael Ahak. I'm the Director of Technology and Innovation of the District here. Uh, two pieces that I'd like to share with you for my update. So you'll notice that there is no enrollment report in this board book. And just a reminder that the reason for that is that the first 10 days of the school year, we spend um, cleaning up our enrollment records uh, for state reporting. And so um, there's a 10-day window at the start of the year where that happens, and then after that, we will go through and so the next board meeting will see the enrollment report today. Um, initial quick look at our numbers. It looks like our enrollment is holding steady, perhaps increasing a little bit, but we'll know a little bit more as we go through and clean these records. Um, it looks like we're holding steady. The other piece is that um, the agency of education is changing the way that they are collecting our state reporting this year. Um, and so that's going to add some additional challenges to us in the next two months to meet those requirements. Um, so we're working hard to do that, um, but it is definitely an added stressor to um, our work this fall. And um, we're going to have to solve a lot of problems along the way. Um, so anytime the state changes the system, there are new issues that emerge, and we just kind of have to figure it out as a group. Thank you, Rat. Any questions for Rat? Uh, Adam? Uh, just with regards to enrollment, and I guess this goes back to our conversations about bringing more students into the middle school and high school. What are we? What are our recruitment efforts look like in terms of the Ludlow area? Because over the last three weeks, I've had a couple different conversations with parents uh, of kids uh, that are about to or or already entering into the middle school, and they're they're choosing into Woodstock. Um, so I just want to, I, I see that as a, an, an opportunity to make sure that we're, we're capturing more students. I, I can tell you, Adam, that we now have a bus that picks up in downtown center of Ledlow, right at the shopping center. Awesome. Um, you know, last year we were at Echo Lakes. So we moved that stock into town. I believe we have at least five or six students riding it, but I don't know the exact count yet. Uh, but we're making an effort to meet them at least part way. Um, I can tell you about this field. We were contacted by a student last year who asked for a stop. And I said, sure, give me eight students. So we'll get on that stop with you. He got us 14 students. So we added two stops for him. Mm -hmm. So um, I do the same thing for Ludlow. They uh, took the initiative. Right. And I think, too, yeah. so our, our counseling department does do outreach to the different towns as well. I'll tell you, Shana Kalnitsky, who is our director of student support services, independently has posted on their listserv, has conversations with everyone and anyone. So we're really trying to do some marketing in that area. 
Absolutely. Anybody else? All right, thank you, Rav. Um, now we'll hear from our Director of Student Support Services, Shana Kalnitsky. Hi, I'm Shana Kalnitsky. I live in the district that includes Ludlow, and I attend board meetings in my own district and talk about the ability to go to Woodstock Middle School and High School. So it's, it's a frequent conversation at their board meetings. I don't know that they always want me to say that, but I put in a fun dress. At the beginning of the school year uh, and even the summer has been busy. We welcomed so many new staff members to our department. Some highlights of those positions include special educators, an intensive English instructor uh, in the middle school and high school for our students who are multi-language learners. Uh, we also have a multi-language learning coordinator who joined us, a new SLP, uh, that's a speech and language pathologist. And it's an in-person provider, and we we're so fortunate to find her. New staff um, who've been working with Amanda Ray, um, supporting across all six buildings. We do share staff at small schools and uh, making sure that amongst those six buildings, um, scheduling classes, making sure services are provided, and also making sure that our new staff has access to the same high quality learning that our other educators have in the areas of literacy and mathematics, in addition to some of the special education resources and tools that are available. And speaking of that professional development, this year we're going to be extending the learning that our educators, um, classroom educators have had to our paraeducators. So Julie uh, Brown, who's our literacy coordinator, and Patty Kelly, who's our math coordinator, will be working uh, with Lori B. Lamb and in the areas of literacy, mathematics, and social emotional learning so that the work that the classroom teachers are doing, the paraeducators can support as well. And they'll be learning proven strategies to build reading fluency and real life math problems, and also building relationships and responding appropriately to students who may be dysregulated or challenging and having some big feelings um, in class. And also we are working in our department on transitioning over to a new information system that does sync with the AOE. We are switching to EdDoc Vermont. We're spending the entire year migrating from our current IEP, that's Individual Education Program, the document that outlines the specialized instruction and services for students who are eligible for special education. And the reason for that is because our old system did not sync with the AOE. Whenever they made a change or had a new form, we had to have it totally reprogrammed. So the new system is more efficient. It's a much better value because we can centralize all of that information to be accessed by all of our administrators and educators across the district. And we will be uh, working on that for the entire school year to make sure that it's as smooth as it can be. Thank you, Shana. Any, you. any questions for Shana? Okay, thank you. Um, now we'll hear from the Director of Curriculum Instruction and Assessment, Jen Settle. Hi, everyone. First, I want to extend a thank you to the community members. Thank you. Thank you. I really much appreciate you having your voice present. Um, I wanted to first um, speak to this summer. This summer was a busy summer for our teachers. We had 200 days at least worth of work happening for our teachers. A lot of the work that needs to happen above our schools level needs to happen during the summer. We don't have time during the school year. So thanks to a little bit of local funds, but mostly grant funds, title funds, and ESSER, we had a lot of work happening. What that meant was our payroll department was very stressed with lots of paychecks coming in. So I did want to give a public thank you to Jennifer Conrad for all the work she did to process all those payments. Um, we are a team in terms of making everything happen in this district, and she definitely made sure everyone got paid, and I wanted to say thank you. It was an extra task for her this summer. Um, additionally, we had the opportunity to bring on some new teachers, and with some more grant funds, we do have retired teacher Tim Brennan back among us a little bit. We have a little stipend for him where he is piloting a new teacher mentorship program at the high school and middle school that includes one-on-one -on -one mentoring for those teachers and also the mentors to try and have a really nice wraparound design that maybe we can use in other schools in the future. As I said, it's just a pilot and we're trying it out, but it's great to have an experienced teacher back with us doing that work for all of us. Um, we do have incredible professional development happening this year from our Late Start Wednesdays to our job embedded professional development. 
That also includes a lot of credit bearing and workshops, um, credit bearing tuition courses that teachers are taking and workshops. To date, we've had 45 credit bearing tuition reimbursement requests from our teachers. That goes to show how hungry our teachers are for excellent professional learning, not only with what's happening in our district, but they go out elsewhere and bring that learning back to us. So again, a thank you to all of you for supporting the tuition reimbursement line for our teachers. Um, as you heard from Elizabeth Reeves, we do have a new resource that's embedded in the board packet about our math and literacy initiatives and um, how they came to be, what our proficiency goals are, some of the stuff we've taken in, how we are competing in those, goal those goals, maybe might help you answer the, some of the questions, answer some of the questions you're encountering in the community about this topic. Um, I highly recommend you read it. If you just want a summary, reach out to me. I'll meet with you and we can talk about it as well. Um, hopefully that is a helpful go-to resource for you as you uh, encounter community members or teachers or even just have your own curiosity about those initiatives. We do have a new math pilot happening this year at the elementary level. We are piloting a new math program. Uh, teachers who are participating in the pilot will be reaching out to families to share a little bit more information about this pilot. The old program we were using in our elementary classrooms for mathematics uh, was being phased out and was no longer relevant or being published. So it was time for us to move on. Um, so we had a group of teachers come together last year to select a couple of programs for the pilot, and we are in the midst of that right now. Um, and you'll also be hearing about that through your newsletters at the elementary level. Um, and then finally, uh, we do have the opening of our fall assessment window. Um, so uh, students will be uh, assessed and any of the subjects that we do our assessments in uh, so that we can get a baseline reading so that we can continue to improve um, academics for our students. Thank you very much, Jen. Any questions, comments for Jen? Okay, thank you. At this time, we'll move into our time scheduled appointments, starting with uh, an introduction to Parent Square from Brady Fisher. Okay, this is currently one of my favorite topics, but I will try to keep it brief. So, Parents Square came about uh, because we were looking at ways to improve our communication. Um, Parents Square is currently being used district wide as a platform of home to school and school to home communication. Uh, one of the problems that uh, I see in my current position and in the seven years I was at the Reading Elementary School is trying to get communication to all stakeholders. And it's very labor intensive. And I know our current admin assistants face the same thing. Um, you know, you have email, you have um, listservs, you have front porch forum, you have our website, you have their website. Um, and still we hear people say, we didn't know about that. And so we were looking for a way to um, fix that, especially in light of this past January, February, March, when we were looking at bond and there were a lot of people who did not have the information that they were looking for and no easy way to get it. So this is what it used to look like, trying to get information out to people. Um, I actually found out surprisingly that there are some teachers who text their parents with their personal cell phones, um, giving them their contact information 24 seven, which I found a little, um, I'm very much a work-life balance person. And so I was uh, a little concerned finding that they, the only way that they could communicate with parents was on their personal time with their personal phone. So what Parents Square does is it takes all of those, uh, it takes all of the staff contact and all of the parent contacts and routes it through Parents Square. <laughs> Parents Square is very safe and secure. So here's what Parents Square can do. We've actually replaced our um, school messenger, which was an alert system with this program. And we've also replaced SMORE with this system. So we're taking systems that can only serve one purpose and trying to find a system that can serve multiple purposes. So basically teachers and staff share school related news to parents where parents and guardians receive the information in a manner that they want. So if they want to receive it via a text, they can, if they wanna receive it in their email, they can. So it's all about receiving information in the manner that they want. 
And it's also in their preferred language as we diversify and we get families here whose English is not their native language. This has an automatic um, translation feature and it's a two-way translation. So the teachers can communicate to a parent in their language. It automatically translates into the parent's preferred language. And when they respond, it automatically translates back into the teacher's preferred language. Mm -hmm. And one thing is, this is all in one place. You don't have to go multiple places to get the information. So here's some things that it can do. Um, like I said, so there is a web portal that you can go. Um, it also has an app, which is currently my favorite method. Um, you can, like I said, receive text messages. And here is what I mean by information is all in one place. There's a calendar feature. And if you look, the upcoming events are on the right-hand side. Those are all events district-wide and individualized by school. So schools add their events, their parents see their school events, but they also see things I put in as a district-wide, for example, our board meetings. So people always don't know when the board meetings are, don't have the Zoom link, or don't have the agenda, and it's all in one place. Another capability of ParentSquare, which we have not activated yet, is community groups. This is uh, something that I was very interested in. So yes, we wanna communicate to our staff and to our families, but extending our efforts out into the community is something that I was really interested in. Let me drag this. see the top of my screen. So here is currently what our district dashboard looks like. This shows me that currently all of our families are contactable in one way or another. So I also get a report every day um, if a parent has changed one of their contact methods, like their phone number changed or their email changed. So I can go immediately into Alma and make the update there. And one thing that I like for, uh, from a staff point of view, is the metrics that we can receive on how we are reaching people, what their preferred method is, how they're receiving the information, things that, like, to date, since I believe the end of June, um, there's been 356 direct messages. That's messages from parents to their kid's teacher or vice versa. But this also shows how people are interacting and by school, like performance wise, who's sending out the main posts. So go Melissa Zorhide for being the leader so far of posts. And we're just sort of skimming the surface right now. We're getting the basics down because the first thing we wanna do is parents to be able to reach their teachers. Um, and other way around, teachers to be able to reach the parents. So that's what we're focusing on right now. Sounds like a really powerful program. I yeah. believe it can be. I believe it can be. Yeah. Um, it sounds great. Um, my mm -hmm. company uses something like it, my nonprofit uses something like this slack um have the teachers been trained because i have to tell you my son's teacher is telling me everything's going to be on alma all assignments all communications alma 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 so do the teachers know that this is so they do um they do i went around to every school um at the the in-service days before school started and introduced it to all of the teachers um, the goal is to use Parent Square. Um, there are enough challenges at the beginning of a school year, just getting the new school year off the ground and to throw uh, learning a new um, system at teachers is more difficult for some than others. Um, some people jumped in with both feet and embraced it fully, and some people need to just dip their toe in and, and learn it. But eventually, the goal is parents' work. 
because we want to eliminate the amount of places people have to go to get information. So, like with Alma, become like right now, <clears throat> you can find your kids' assignments if the parent, if the teacher puts them on Alma. Would you like take that function off of Alma just to push it into its? I'm just trying to figure out how the two will work. Like, will Alma always exist? Parent Square. Yes, Alma is our student information system, so we will always have Alma. Um, Parent Square is a communication platform. Um, so I'm assuming, where's Rap? I'm assuming we will still keep homework and assignments and stuff on it. Alma. Okay. Got it. Bob? Yeah. How much does it cost? Cheaper than the other two combined. I know it went down. We had a little bit of a fee this year for implementation, but year by year, it's cheaper than the two we that we replaced with it. Sounds like a good system so far. Mm -hmm. It just trains <clears throat> how to cancel school. <laughs> <laughs> Any other comments from the board? Yeah. Right. The uh, confidentiality that like any parent and teacher conversation are you able to access their conversation to the app it's all separated yes one way or another the encryption correct thank you so do parents have to do something to sign up for this or like when i'm getting emails is it coming through that already so whether you have a parent square account or not if your email address is in Alma, it is being populated into Parent Square, and that's how you'll receive the information. So you'll still get any, it'll still look like an email. But if you want to um, view the website or if you want to view the app, um, then you would have to actually um, activate your account. And have, have or will parents like get notified that they need to do that? I have sent out a notification okay. email, um, and I know the principals individually have also sent out notification emails. Would you like me to see if you opened it? <laughs> <laughs> On screen. I will have it there. So, you know, Alma has that um, the consequences. If you don't do your forms, your kid can't go on a field trip. Or is there something we've come up with to get parents to use Parent Square? <laughs> There is a forms and permissions feature. Um, I, like I said, we we want to do the basics of communication first, but there are a lot of like event features, signups. Um, you can schedule parent teacher conferences through it, um, yeah. and you can do forms as well. But what I'm saying is, can we, have we come up with a way to, parents. to to encourage parents to open their accounts, like saying? Like with Alma, we say you can't take your first field trip until you do your Alma form. Have we come up with an incentive or a consequence to get parents to actually open up Parent Square accounts? Because they're still receiving the information, regardless of whether they activate their accounts or not. Um, I don't want to, despite what my boss thinks, I'm not a pushy person. <laughs> So I don't want to push people to receive information in a manner that they don't want to. If they want the app, then they would activate their accounts. But if they don't want the app and email suits them, then that's they'll still get the information. Elliot. So can this act um, for an emergency as well to fulfill the role of that we were talking about earlier? That Absolutely. There's something like a lockdown or something that is in Absolutely. Yep. So you should train the superintendent. Yeah. It's so, very user friendly, so it'll be. So we have all these forms of communication already in tag, well in place. However, parents have been talking to teachers and vice versa. What is this doing that we have to spend money on to buy this program or whatever? I mean, there, there's already communication. My kids have been here so, for seven years. I talk with every teacher instantly. I mean, they are very responsive, mm -hmm. uh, especially at Prosper, not at just the others, just the top ones Prosper Valley. Mm -hmm. uh, very responsive, very easy to get in touch with. I felt up to date the last six or seven years with all three of my kids. So I'm just confused on why it's not good enough how we've been doing it. Like, are, are there people struggling to know how to communicate with the teachers and each other? If 
if a parent is reaching out directly to a teacher and they're responding and that's that's working for them, then um, by all means, parent square is so when you send a message out in Alma, it just goes out. It goes out into the ether. You have no idea if it was received, if it went to a spam folder, if they looked at it. With this, we do. Um, and it puts all of the information in one spot. If you didn't have to go and look up the teacher's email address, or if you didn't have to go look up the school phone number, and it's all in one place, and you just flip open your app and hit that little message button that you want to send a message, it's that simple. And it hand delivers information to people in the manner that they wish to receive the information. And some more was getting more and more expensive. So the newsletters that you were receiving from Aaron and from other principals. So some more, which was our way we published our newsletters, are, the costs are really going through the roof. So that's when the they, cost comparison between that and the school program. It's for two different programs, Rena said, that we were using. This is less than those two combined. Yeah, we replaced our emergency first. notification system, which was School Messenger, and we replaced our SMORE account, which uh, they more than doubled on us, I believe. I, I guess I'm just confused on why we even have to pay for something like this if we can already text and communicate. I'm glad it's cheaper than what other options are that you're getting rid of, but it's still an unnecessary expense when our budget is so skewed and messed up right now. Because we already have communication in place. It sounds nice. I mean, I get the concept. I just don't understand the urgency or the necessity for us, I guess. Well, it's our and emergency the, notification system. We had well, it wasn't working, it wasn't working it wasn't great. Working. So well, that's good to know. Well, I mean, it was working at five o'clock in the morning when I'm telling you a snow day, but there were other times where I needed to be at a certain place and location because there are like five different passcodes. It takes 10 different steps. It's not a, an efficient system. It's a, a system we were using. So this will make it a lot easier for me to get notifications out. For example, when we had to close the school that, that Wednesday morning at the high school, I had to run over here because I couldn't do it on my cell phone. I had to use my, so there's some real, we were using it. It's the system we had. This is a much more efficient system. That's just school night. Great. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yes, Heather. Thank you. I'd like to share that um, Randolph recently adopted this platform. And the most important thing I'd like to share is it replaces text. Like you, you said, we already have text. But teachers and parents should not be texting parents from their cell phones. And so today we had a bomb uh, threat. And I was able to send out through Parent Square a text to all families without using my own cell phone. It goes through Parent Square. It really keeps our educators safe. And we also replaced S'more and replaced uh, Messenger. And it is a cost savings. And it gives us the added capability of text which we did not have with those previous platforms. So I just want to throw my voice behind Raina and say, this is a great adoption. Thank you. Anybody else? All right. We'll move now into uh, an, a discussion of AI by uh, Raf. Did you want me to put, are you, I saw you're on. Yeah. <laughs> great, thank you. The folks in the back want chairs, but you can take the chair from the table. Brand, can you make the Um, so last spring, um, you may remember I came before the board and we talked a little bit about the status of some AI work that we were doing here in the district and just wanted to give you an update as to where we are and some pieces that have uh, come out since then. Um, so 
Last year, um, I was approached by um, Warren Sullivan Justice at the start of the year. She said, what are we doing about AI? How are we going to be handling AI this year? And I said, it's a really good question. I knew that Garen and Cody had revised one sentence of the academic integrity policy to talk about generative AI. And we said, well, let's kind of see how that goes. And we started to go in the year, and it became pretty apparent that that wasn't enough. That, that there was a lot of nuance, there was a lot of complexity that um, was coming out with generative AI, and that that really made things different. Um, then later in the year, um, Andy Smith came to me and said, Hey, I'd love to experiment with my um, computer science students and using generative AI for coding. Can I do it? And I said, No, I can't because of the privacy concerns and because of the terms of service. And so this group said, you know, we really like to talk about some of these things. We want to get together. We want to do more work around this. So last year, um, we had this AI work group that formed. And we started, and originally we were going to be looking at creating guidelines for students. Um, but what was really interesting and what I learned was that we came up with just as many guidelines, if not more, for educators than we did for students. Um, so there's a lot of interesting complexity around this. Um, one of the big pieces that came out um, was that if we wanted to use, have students use any AI in our schools, um, the terms of service of these agreements make it such that we have to get parental permission. They all say students between the age of 13 and 18 need parental permission. And so after doing a little bit of research at other schools, realized that really the only way to do that was to ask permission. <clears throat> So we built um, in the annual forms an AI permission form where parents can say yes or no, whether they would want their um, child to have access to some generative AI tools through um, their school issued account. And parents are going through and are answering that um, as they complete the forms this year. So this was all work that we did last year when we got to the summer. Um, and then um, Aaron came on and, and asked a really good question and said, well, what, what are experts like? Has anyone outside our organization really looked at this? That's, that's a great question. We should, we should do that. And so who can we get to um, help us understand and can give us some feedback on where we are and make sure that we're, we're kind of heading in the right direction? Um, so we we're fortunate enough over the summer to um, find a number of different experts to work with us. So um, Justin Reich is a MIT professor and the director of the Teaching Systems Lab at MIT. He's also sort of a friend of the district. He has a house in Barnard and sent his kids to Barnard Academy during COVID and had a wonderful experience. Um, so I reached out to him. He put me in contact with some other people in his group, um, Jesse Dukes and Natasha Estevez. And Jesse was our, my main contact. And they've been talking to educators all over the country for their podcasts and trying to understand all the different complexities around it. And so um, Jesse, Justin, and Tasha gave us feedback on our guidelines, lots and lots of feedback. Um, it was very helpful. Um, a lot of it was sort of affirming in the direction that we were going in, and they also challenged us on a number of things as well. So it was really good to get that outside perspective. After doing that, we realized that we needed to find someone who could help us um, bring forward some professional development for our educators. Um, and so for this, we reached out to Greg Kulowick. Greg is a consultant, a former teacher and tech director who's been training um, schools all over the country around how AI is working. So um, we shared our guidelines with Greg, and then we had a, um, Greg did a two-hour professional development session with the teachers at the middle school, high school at the start of this year um, to just begin to lay the foundation for understanding what generative AI is and how it works. Um, so this year we're really looking at this initial implementation where we're starting to dabble with it. Um, one of the phrases that Greg used for us was that we need to learn really quickly and move slowly as we do this work. Um, so we're, we're trying to learn as much as we can and, and, and start taking on some new pieces. Um, we're doing additional professional development and we're also doing some design workshops with teachers who are really hoping focusing in on specific aspects of generative AI, questions that they have, problems that they have, and having some deeper conversations about how we can help resolve these things. Um, one of the pieces that Greg shared with us, and, and this is a paper, and this is just a way of thinking about this that is really different, and I want to share it with you because I think it really begins to highlight how this is different from many things that we've seen in the past. 
And this is this concept of technologies that have arrived versus technologies that are adopted. Um, and so this was a paper that these folks at MIT wrote, but there's this, this really specific piece, which I think really gets to, which is generative AI is an arrival technology. So unlike laptop computers, its presence in schools is not the result of a policy adoption. Like smartphones, students are using generative AI in school assignments regardless of whether schools encourage or forbid it. And this is what we saw last year. We saw students using the tools outside of school and teachers getting into these power struggles with students around, did you use generative AI for this or not? And, and what that is. Um, arrival technologies are really tricky and they can really harm schools if they're not effectively managed. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to lay this foundation and begin to acknowledge that it is an arrival technology, but then how do we create an environment for learning for our students um, instead of giving them these power struggles? Um, one piece that Greg Kulwick really emphasizes is trying to understand how these models are working. And so he gave us a great simple example, which I'll, I'll share with you here. And, so these models are predictive. It seems like if you've used any of these tools before, it seems like there's intelligence, it seems like there's this capability to do all this, but it's really just sophisticated prediction. And the simplest example is, you know, if you say peanut butter and banana. <laughs> banana was one of the options. <laughs> the most common answer is jelly, and 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 that's what the system is doing. It, it is going through and predicting what the next word is. And so understanding how they work, understanding the shortcomings, understanding what they can do and what they can't do is something that we want our educators to be working on, we want our students to be working on, because these are technologies we're going to have to understand in order to be watching what's working. So a few major takeaways. Um, we can't ignore the arrival of generative AI, even if we even if we didn't, if we want to ban it outright, it's it's if we're having students do work outside of school, um, it's highly likely that they would use other tools and other ways to do that. Um, we need to understand how it works as best as we can, and so we can understand where, where it's applicable and where it's not. Um, we want to focus on assignments and tasks, not on AI detection. This was one of the more um, controversial part of our data, which is saying that teachers should not be using um, AI detection tools because they are inaccurate, they're not consistent, they're not replicable. And we really want to have an environment where students are being asked to do tasks that AI can't do for us. And so that the teacher is asking a student to do something and they use generative AI for it, it's really obvious. And um, so we want to be focusing on those tasks. And if we do that, there are opportunities for both students and teachers around personalizing education, making education more accessible to students. So we, in the past, we've talked about universal design for learning, making different ways of bringing material forward to students. And I can help with a lot of that. Um, we just have to be very thoughtful about how we're doing it and proceed forward um, and try to produce it and, and learn from learn from as we go. Um, so we have some additional PD sessions, two more PD sessions scheduled with Greg Hulu later this year, and um, we'll revisit this at the end of the year and see where our guidelines are and what needs to be changed. Thank you, Raf. Any questions for Raf? Ben? Oh. Yeah, Raf, that was really excellent. Um, to pull that group of experts together like that, I mean, that was a clinic on how we should tackle issues like this. And thank you so much for your work and your presentation. On, um, on, the, on the opportunity section, I apologize. Um, both my audio and my ears are not working great right now. Um, what I, I don't know if I heard was the opportunity to kind of equip students with the ability to effectively use AI in an ethical and responsible way. Is that something that we're encouraging our teachers uh, to work into the curriculum. And the reason I asked the question is, you know, we're going to be sending these kids out into a world where they'll be expected to use it. Yes, absolutely. And I think um, there are some, some of our educators who are more, you know, wanting to adopt this more quickly are, are really equipped to do that. So Andy Smith, 
um, I think, is having these conversations with his computer science students and showing them how you know it can help in their coding, but how they don't have the basic knowledge, then they're not going to be able to use the tools effectively. So I, I think we want to get there. We have to lay a lot of foundations to begin with, just so that we can we can um, even have those conversations. But yeah, absolutely, that's where we want to get. To. We want to be able to equip our students to have these conversations and, and, and to understand how the tools are working. And I think, you know, in, in conversations, because I sat in on that session, as well as with RAF, there are opportunities to take away some of the responsibilities of teachers that are incredibly repetitive, that will allow teachers to have more involvement, hands-on with students. Um, I can say as a special educator, I would write a report. It would take me eight hours. After you've been a diagnostician for years, it's just like an automatic pilot. That is not a good use of time. This is data, this is information. I can pull in my prompts. I can write, and then I can go back and put my voice into it. So that alone for a special educator to have a system like that, who can do a first draft, that you can upload those parameters. Um, I think there's lots of opportunities that will increase the forward facing contact between teacher and student. And some of those more repetitive tasks can be used AI is a first draft and then bringing it. So I think there's some real opportunities that so English teachers are not taking home those bags of 80 essays on Catcher in the Rye that they're going to have to read that weekend and edit for. So we're going to look at it and we're going to look with our teachers around how that makes sense. And then hopefully having more time to do the, the real work uh, in front of students. So we're interesting. And really wonderful. Thank you guys. Raph, I was just going to ask um, those future PD sessions, um, kind of what the thoughts are, if, if it would make sense to um, allow kind of uh, parents uh, in, in the district to kind of observe. I think just the more opportunity we have for folks to um, to better understand what this looks like and feels like, um, the better chance we have of people, you know, um, buying into it. Yeah, we'd have to talk to our, our presenter about that. Um, but yeah, I, I agree. I mean, the more people that we can have in the conversation, the better. Um, it, um, it's been a really good dynamic conversation. And where we are landing is that you know, there are teachers who are saying they don't want to use, use AI right now. And that is 100% fine. Um, what they need to do is they need to be aware that if they're giving assignments to students, and those assignments are conducted outside the class, that students may be using AI whether they're instructed to or not. And so that's really where we're starting. Um, but yeah, I think the more people we can get involved in the conversation, we're trying to fight. Like, or or yeah. minimally, if it's if it feels like too much to open it up to the broader, you know, parent community um for board members to have the opportunity to um to uh, audit it. Those parent responses on the alma forms, were they generally positive, mixed? Like, do you have a sense of what happened? Yeah, I checked on Friday and we'd only gotten 30% um, back, but they were very, very positive. Okay. Anybody else? Oh, go ahead, Brian. Uh, on the AI, for instance, when you just put that on the screen, you ask, you know, peanut butter, the AI would get jelly. I did, I had banana because that's a pretty common thing. Yeah. And because I thought for myself, twenty people just publicly laughed at me for my own thought. And it's because it didn't do there. Yeah. I don't think that's cool. That's not. So when kids are in class and they use their own mind to answer a question, are they going to get publicly shamed and laughed at? If well, it doesn't line up with that, because we're being programmed to fall in line here. No, I, I think you raised it. You raised a really good point. And one of the pieces that was raised during our professional development is that the use of generative AI um, ten, in, in writing tends to make it more similar. And I think that's something that we really have to be aware of. And that that may not be something at all that we want. We don't want every no, single unique ones, right? Yeah, exactly. So, so that's the opposite. So, so they all laugh at me for being me. So, so, so I think that absolutely, like understanding those the, where those different pieces are, um, is is really important. And where we need to focus on uniqueness is it is not a place where where AI is involved. Absolutely. 
Thank you. Usually we don't have parents or oh sorry audience speak during this time, but you can certainly ask during the public comment. Anybody else? All right, thank you. Um, thank you, Raph. That was fascinating. <laughs> really. All right, and now we have a presentation from Aaron about cell phones in school. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good evening, board. Thanks for having me tonight. Certainly keep it brief. Certainly appreciate the community members and parents and students that have joined us this, this evening and have also already spoken to quite a bit of this. So I'm going to do a really quick abbreviated version. Um, I've shared a PowerPoint presentation with you that's reasonably comprehensive, and then I collapsed it down for a few minutes here, and I'm even collapse it even down even further uh, just to a couple of minutes of your time. Uh, but there's a, I've also shared with you through Superintendent Sousa some, some resources, a couple and some data. Uh, but I just want an opportunity to keep the board abreast of uh, our journey towards a cell phone free uh, teaching and learning environment, uh, where our goal is, is to maximize all the resources that this community is so privileged to have access to for these students. Um, so I just really want an opportunity to, again, bring you in the loop on a couple of things. I have two guests with me this evening. Uh, which will introduce to you and provide an opportunity for some question and answer if you like. Uh, Dr. Ray Chin is here. He is a clinical child psychologist in our area, a clinical psychologist in our area, uh, and has been uh, a resource to many of the schools in our area as they've embarked on this journey. Uh, so we have uh, Dr. Chin here available to us. He can help speak to any of the uh, uh, social, emotional, behavioral learning uh, uh, implications of, of such a move. Uh, and also online, we have uh, Dr. Mitch Princeton. Uh, he uh, is from uh, the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Uh, and I'm honored to announce that uh, we have partnered uh, with the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, uh, specifically, uh, excuse me, uh, the Winston National Center on Technology, Use, Brain, and, and Psychological Development. Uh, Dr. Princeton is also part of Project SMILE, an acronym, acronym that stands for Smartphone Interactions and Learning Experience. Uh, and he comes, um, he's also the, the principal researcher, uh, investigator in the Department of Psychology and Neuro, uh, uh, excuse me, and Neurology at UNC. Um, it's interesting, this summer I had an opportunity to connect with a couple of our colleagues up uh, in, as our administrative retreat. And one of the ideas that was thrown on this table was what if we uh, enjoyed and uh, participated in a study? A study that would push on the, the edge of knowledge in this space and also help uh, contribute to the larger body of knowledge, which is becoming uh, much more broad and expansive every day uh, in this field. Um, being a, a researcher uh, and, and really enjoying uh, those, those opportunities and projects, it seemed like a great opportunity to slow down, uh, to learn a lot about this movement uh, and this work. Uh, it involved the Woodstock and the Union communities in something a little bit larger than ourselves. Um, so it seemed like a great opportunity to achieve all those things at once. Um, so uh, again, I have lots of statistics and data to share. I'm happy to do that uh, through uh, Superintendent Sousa. Um, now, necessarily not necessarily the time uh, at this point. Uh, in the PowerPoint, there's uh, lots of links and resources. Uh, it's not a comprehensive list. I have much more. I've been uh, thinking about this for years. Uh, I had the pleasure of, of, of meeting um, uh, a, a mother in our community uh, and in Vermont that's been very helpful uh, in this effort and has provided lots of resources and connections as well. Um, so I just wanted to essentially let you know that um, we do have some community forums scheduled. Uh, the first one is September 9th, 19th, uh, 6.30 over at the high school, specific room to be determined. Uh, we'll follow up again with another evening uh, opportunity for families and, and students in the community to join on October 3rd, 6.30, and then try to get in a morning session the following morning for those that, that work and may be more challenging, uh, but the uh, 8 o'clock on uh, uh, Friday, October 4th. Um, so those are venues in which we'll have opportunities to um, share a little bit more about what we're doing here and why we're doing it, but also hear from the community, uh, any questions, uh, uh, concerns. Um, be able to address all of those in those forums. Um, thinking about offering a remote option for those that, that may not be able to join any of those in person. Uh, so we'll, we'll work to make that happen. And then uh, most certainly and on the edge of, of my mind is uh, the student experience and the student voice in this process. Um, so once we get some things going, we've been talking about uh, having uh, high school advisories, a location for conversation, uh, dialogue, questions and concerns, and some visioning. 
um, and in the middle school um, through our wellness wellness classes. So those are two two ways in which we can catch the vast majority, if not all, of our student population. One, so we can hear from students, hear what their questions are, hear what their concerns are, hear what their experiences are, um, and certainly consider all of those. Uh, and also, I'm very interested in being a part of a, kind of a student steering committee or a larger student body committee uh, where students can um, have access to myself and the assistant principal directly um, so that we can speak freely about these topics and really, um, again, an opportunity to get as many voices um, to the table as possible. But ultimately, as you heard from the folks that have presented already, maybe in the news uh, and in, in the media, um, uh, this, this is uh, really important. Uh, this is the type of work that uh, educators like myself will be in. I really believe that this is an opportunity to really genuinely maximize a lot of opportunities, a lot of resources, and a lot of potential uh, in our schools and our learning environment. Um, and it's been articulated by some as, as an opportunity, a tool, uh, an implementation strategy that really can level the playing field to some extent for an entire population uh, in a very particular way, in this specific way. Um, so I don't want to, you know, keep you too much. I did bring some examples uh, of some resources and documents. Um, I think one of the things that's really interesting is just a list of uh, a bunch of schools uh, in New England and around uh, and, and beyond uh, that have already embarked on, on this journey. These specific schools are those that are using the Yonder Pouch approach, uh, but that for Academy is also represented here today, as well as Lamoille, South Week, South Supervisory Union, the entire SU uh, has made this commitment uh, for all the same reasons I've described and are, are beginning to see as our uh, uh, Thetford student, thank you for joining us, um, has spoken so eloquently to um, these schools that are doing this work and these communities that are supporting this work are seeing benefits. Um, they're seeing the benefits um, uh, uh, that we've all been speaking to, the social, emotional, behavior, and academic benefits. And I believe that our students deserve that opportunity as well. Um, so uh, again, I'm happy to share some resources and pass them around. I've made copies of many, um, but here are uh, examples of the Phone Free Schools uh, Administrator Toolkit, which is a resource that I and many other principals in the area that have uh, embarked on this journey have been using. So I encourage you to, to take one. If there's not enough, I can make more. They're also digitally linked in the presentation. Um, I'd like to provide you with a copy of um, just an, an outline of Project SMILE and the, the study, which I forgot to mention, we intend to be longitudinal. So this is an opportunity for students, families, and teachers in our community to um, anonymously contribute data on an ongoing basis regarding their experience in this regard uh, over, over some time. Um, and this has the ability to really uh, help us as a school district, a community, a state, uh, a region, a nation, uh, and part of a, be part of the global community as we we all have this common goal. So a bit of an overview of the actual study, uh, and then uh, a, a nice example uh, of a parental permission a consent form from the University of North Carolina are also available for you. Um, again, list of, of local schools also linked in. Um, I find this to be a really nice resource, cell phones and school safety. I think one of the, the myths and facts that we'll talk about in uh, these community forums is around school safety, also spoken, uh, addressed this evening. Um, but there's some really concrete um, concrete examples uh, um, and rationale for, um, for the ways in which we might navigate a school and learning environment when cell phones are not present. Um, and then also linked in the presentation is a, a draft uh, letter to the family, students, and communities uh, that outlines uh, this journey uh, and the implementation steps. Um, so do we have a specific implementation date for this intervention? No, we don't yet. And that's okay with me. Uh, it was really important to me that we have this conversation as a community and board, have these other conversations, uh, forums with, with the community and with students. Um, but all the while, behind the scenes, administration is, is doing their homework, uh, doing the research, playing out uh, implementation strategies, um, and is, is ready to go. Um, so again, uh, Dr. Uh, Mitch Prinstein here from the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. Um, thank you for your patience uh, this evening. Uh, it's here to maybe answer any questions that you might have about a, the study uh, that we hope to get the vast majority, if not all, of our community involved in. It's just a great opportunity um, you can speak to the de-identification of data or any of anything that, that might be on your mind. Um, and uh, Dr. Chin is also here again 
help speak to the social, emotional, learning, behavioral, academic uh, implications of such such an intervention. Um, so again, it's a lot. I had a presentation, compressing it down to just chatting at you, um, and I've got a plethora of resources and much more in my office. So looks thanks for like, the opportunity. Looks like Anna has a question. Thank you, Anna. Thank you, Dr. C. Um, I didn't hear any ability from um, our Prosper Valley students to have input. Um, is there a way that we can elicit those, maybe not necessarily on the advisory group specifically, um, but you and I happen to know a student that lives in my household, <laughs> my son, who's at Prosper Valley, and he has uh, some pretty strong opinions about this. Um, what would be the route for them to get their thoughts to you as well as it will be affecting them also? Yeah, thanks. Um, say hi to, to our friend for me. Uh, but yeah, I would encourage you and your son to join us in any of the three community forums coming up. Um, I'm also happy to speak with the Prosper Valley principal and see if there's another way in which uh, that we can solicit uh, fifth and sixth grade perspectives uh, on the topic. So happy. So again, the invitation is open to anyone and everyone. So please join us. And again, happy to reach out to the principal there. Yeah, I think it would be um, a good um, sort of effort to Prosper Valley um, to have a, a collection of opinions so that it's not just whether they can attend a meeting, but rather, you know, um, maybe through health classes, you had mentioned through the, the middle school, yes. but but an actual official way of collecting that input from them. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you, Anna. Uh, Bob, and then I had asked Owen, our student um, board member, to bring some thoughts as well. He's ready to do that after uh, after. You guys haven't run them by me yet, so I don't know. <laughs> Bob. Yeah, two questions. Um, number one, where, where do we think uh, the pushback might come on this, do we think it would be from students? Would it be from teachers? Would it be from parents? Or would it be from some of the people on this board? And the second question is, regardless of the answer to the first question, wouldn't the first step be to start immediately writing a policy regarding this? Uh, that would be nice. And uh, without a policy in place, I'm happy to create a practice uh, that I'd be happy for you to review, uh, but that we intend to implement uh, at some point this school year. Um, if you want to follow with the policy, uh, I, again, yeah, that would be wonderful. Um, but until that happens, uh, we are already in position to continue with, with our work in this space. Um, as for those that might be pushing back, I mean, you know, this is a topic that is uh, that, that can be really hot and, uh, you know, prepared pushback from anyone at any time. I, I will say that when I bring this up at uh, the staff meetings at the middle school and high school, um, I wouldn't say it's a standing ovation because uh, most people stay seated, but I would certainly say that it's uh, a, a full full room uh, of applause most recently was a week ago. Uh, and that was just simply by uh, we had just looking at some some data and we've had a few cell phone violations and I just remind folks that that pretty soon we'll never have to have those conversations again. Uh, the NEA has also done some massive study and surveyed their population across the country. Uh, I have that research. It's also linked into the presentation. Uh, and they're also in support uh, as, as a, the National Education Association. Uh, as for parents, uh, I do believe that once we can navigate the, the facts versus the myths, uh, it becomes quite clear that this is an intervention worth trying at the very least. Uh, if we can't convince folks all the way. Uh, but uh, Dr. Princeton, is there any uh, anything you've seen in your experience uh, over these studies that may help answer this question for, for Mr. Green? Yeah, thanks so much. Um, we are seeing across the country different folks having different opinions about this, which is where our job is to really provide you with objective data that are allowing you to make decisions as a community based on what you see before, during, and after a policy that's put into place and across different parts of the community. We're actually doing this across different communities in the country. So you'll be able to have access to the results from those objective data to be able to guide what policy makes the most sense for you. Thank you. Let me speak to that. Uh, Dr. Chen, please. Uh, Good evening. Mind my mess. I'm sorry. Yeah. I mean, that's like my dad. I'm glad to be here. Uh, I spoke with Terry Brennan, who's the principal at TA today. And uh, as you know, 
it's been implemented. And I asked her, well, what's the first uh, two and a half weeks been like? And so I want to tell you that uh, on the first day, two students said they were initially resistant. But by the end of the day, um, the two students came to her and told her that they were grateful. And and were surprised by how chatty they were at lunch. Uh, and I've heard this from other uh, teachers and students that it's amazing to see how quiet the lunchroom is because they're texting, but but the silliness of it was I don't know silly segment, but people were texting who were in arms reach of each other to themselves. Uh, anyway, one of them said, quote, I can breathe. Um, and but the explanation was, I don't have to worry about checking my phone. Um, another quote, I was never so happy to be bored. Um, quote, I felt my feelings when I was sad, I allowed myself to be sad. And, quote, I learned irony that the loss of social media made me more social. <laughs> and that finding is uh, consistent with at least the literature search that I've had, uh, is that the ability to communicate face to face, um, and I don't mean, by the way, on the screen, because that's not even close to being you know, the real thing. Um, we're losing that. Losing the ability to see uh, people in, and not virtually in reality. Because there's so much more communication. Um, and as far as uh, complaints, okay, uh, well, I can tell you that the middle school students, for the most part, are leaving with phones at home, if they even have them. Um, the high school students, so far, are complying. Uh, either leaving phones at home or putting them in the yonder pocket. Uh, I don't know if you know what that is, but it's a pouch that is locked electronically, and you need to have a device that unlocks it. It's just like the um, things when you go in the store, the tags are you know, locked. Okay. Um, oh, and, and one thing that's really important is the cost for some parents. And um, and um, all the pouches, um, the cost was $12,000 all through donations. They didn't use any um, student, I mean, uh, educational funds. Mm -hmm. So, um, and the only complaint by students who want access to headphones and AirPods uh, was because they needed to listen to music on their laptops to help them focus or cancel out noise and distractions from the emotions of the classroom. And so they're working on that. Uh, it, it seems, I mean, people are taking that seriously for the good of the Okay. Um, there were no so far parent complaints. Um, and, and I have to say, that I think that's in part because of the number of um, meetings that were held, in, which I, you know, obviously you're not planning on that. Um, and students mostly texted their parents about forgotten gym clothes and lunches. But some parents actually express gratitude for the lack of phones because this is actually teaching the children to be more organized. And not be on calls back up to the um, And the parents also, some parents said that they knew that in the case of a real emergency, that they are confident that they could be readily contacted by the school and vice versa. 
Mm -hmm. um, so that um, parents with yes. sounds really ideal. Seems to me anyway. And it sounds like it's possible back in the grass. You know? mm -hmm. um, anyway, I thought I'd let you have that information. Thank you, Dr. Shannon. All right, I'm going to go to Owen. Yes, thanks. <laughs> I, don't, I don't want to burst the bubble. So, but um, I guess I have a slightly different perspective um, on this one. I think that this is really compelling information for maybe a more rigid restriction on phones at the high school. But uh, I do think that there's a threshold that we might cross if we ban phones entirely. Um, so, for example, mentioned worrying about checking your phone. Like I put my phone in my backpack just about an hour and a half ago, and I'm still worried about checking my phone, even though it's not on me, you know? So there's actually, I think, maybe an element of distraction that comes from not having that be available. Um, and then, you know, obviously I'm thinking about changes in the weather, practice times, pickups, um, but it's probably addressed through parents where the, the other thing is that I really think from talking to students, this is pretty unpopular. Um, and I think, you know, maybe in the short term, maybe in the long term, uh, there's going to be a bit of a resentment problem um, if we just ban phones altogether. So, you know, whatever, I'm a layman and I'm 17 and I'm out of here in a year anyway, so don't listen to me. <laughs> but, um, but I think uh, I, I agree with this information and uh, and it's very compelling, but I do think there's some considerations to be had about banning it entirely. I, I'm a little, a little hesitant there. Thank you. Um, Corinne was next and then Lara. Hey, this is a question for the couple of researchers joining us. I'm curious if there's, um, it. maybe it's too soon, um to have any research yet or data yet on the effect um that restrictions or bans in schools have um on kids beyond the school day um cuz obviously you know end of the school day they'll get their phones back um so is there are there any findings that show that you know having this period of the day where um, phones and social media is not a part of their social fabric and social world is sort of giving them some you know context or insight that then carries beyond the school day? Yeah, thanks for your question. Um, there's been a lot of research on what we know about how smart devices and social media are affecting kids, development of their brains, their ability to sustain attention, and so, and so on. What we don't have yet, though, is the effect of these kinds of policies. So what's been happening so far is that we can see that kids are reporting a remarkable amount of what they call digital stress, the extent to which they feel that they have to be aware of whatever's happening online, uh, addressing whatever notifications are coming. And when kids have their phones out of reach, they continue to feel digital stress because they feel like that's something that they could, should be checking. But when there's a policy that actually locks up the phone or keeps the phone at home or makes it so everyone knows that you can't use the phone, we see that reduction in digital stress. And the reason why that's important is the more kids report digital stress, the more they're reporting depression a year later. We're seeing about 45% of kids reporting so much digital stress that it interferes with their daily roles and routines. The other thing we know is that a lot of the benefits that could come from social media, particularly for those from minoritized populations, is mostly things that can happen with phone use after school. So it's not things that have to happen during the school day. Thank you. Uh, Lara, then Matt. Um, to Owen's point, what if we tried like a one day ban just to see how it feels? And, you know, you're talking about having uh, conversations in advisory and we can have a before and after conversation. Okay, we tried it. What did it feel like for this day? Okay. Matt. Uh, I'll start with a few comments and then end with a question. So 
we're, we're hearing tonight a lot of good evidence of why to do this, and we're hearing it coming from other schools and studies, but let's not forget that two years ago, our board addressed serious behavioral issues at the middle school, high school, and our administration at that time came to us and told us that I think 85 to 90 percent of all behavioral issues were tied to cell phone use, and that was at our school. Uh, and I believe that we have a system that logs all disciplinary actions, and you can check a box if the cell phone was involved. So please remind, like, let us know if my data is off. But I thought it was like pretty much like yeah. eighty percent or something. I believe it was about six hundred cell phone related incidents last year. I believe I don't have attributed the data new at this point in this role, but that's my understanding. Um, we've had a few uh, already this year, and. Uh, and had to follow up accordingly. Uh, yeah, it's it's a it's a challenge. My my observations in the few days we've been in school so far is that students are not texting or calling their families. Uh, obviously, I don't see everybody all the time, but I see enough uh, uh, games and YouTube going on uh, to know that that seems to be the prevailing use. Uh, it's not about communication. Uh, not so far what I can see you know, when moving around the building, but um, most. Every student that has a device, when they move around the building at one point or another, head is down, looking at the screen as they navigate the hallway. Right. So we have evidence that it's, it's these things are happening at our school. I think the second quick comment. I, I I love how you're open to addressing the idea of like um, some students do want uh, earbuds and music, and, and and I think that does work for some students. So if there is a solution, I think that makes sense. And then I, I think I would remind people, like, even if we take away phones, like, we're not taking away laptops. I mean, my daughter can email me any time during the day that she's allowed to be on her laptop, and she's actually more responsive by email than text. I don't know why, but she is. And it, it, quite frankly, you can text on your laptop, too, if you want to. So I wouldn't say we're taking away all forms of communications between parents and kids during the day, because technology can, can you can do that without a smartphone. Yeah. But I think yeah. the smartphone should go personally. Um, and then the last question is, how do we as a board just procedurally line up so that your public meeting process mm -hmm. and our policy development are hand in hand? So should we be planning on a like a vote as a board by October, November, December? I mean, we've got board meetings every month. Sure. Can I, can I, wait? I, I really respect Aaron's process. And I'm hearing all. I mean, I think, and, and Dr. Chan and I have worked together for many years. This is going to be a process for students. We, you know, and, and, and I'm so old where I was there when we banned smoking in school. So I understand how this happens. That's how old I carry it out there. <laughs> um, and so I think we have to recognize the challenges students are facing. This is a really, I mean, this is not, this is chemistry that we're fighting against in terms of what these students have had an experience. I appreciate that Aaron one has brought in nationally recognized researchers, local experts to have this conversation. I respect what we're hearing from Owen. And I think that what Aaron's put in place is opportunities to talk to experts, national and local, has engaged families, has engaged our community, and is engaging students, and then allow them to do that process and then reflecting our policies based on that experience. I just, I want to really validate what our students are experiencing as we create what our response is going to be. Does that make sense? And does that kind of- Yeah, I appreciate that support. Um, it's my understanding that in the near future, perhaps being invited or joining a policy committee um, on your those days, I'm happy to join and start the conversation or uh, start to do some work together yep. whenever you're ready. <laughs> that one or the next one. Yeah. <laughs> Brian. Um, first of all, I'm, I'm for it because everyone kids around the phones way too damn much. <laughs> um, so I, I'm okay with the idea of phones are separate from school or whatnot or school time. My question is. Do we as the school really have to piss everyone off by enforcing this? Or could we give the parents that, I mean, there's hundreds, probably thousands that are very concerned with this and are now being brought aware of the serious negative effects on their children and their social uh, abilities. 
Can we just see how many parents say, hey, stop bringing your guy to phone to school? Because my kids bring the phone, but if they text me, I'm like, stop it, dick. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if we really need to be the enforcers and stir this pot so much without giving parents at least a chance to work with their kids on what they think and uh, read this information with them, go over it, and maybe work out a lot of it first. Then the you know the minority or whatever portions left that's still being defined, our policies uh, adjustment should be able to address that, and it it'd be a more powerful movement, in my opinion, instead of school enforcing it and taking something away from kids. Whereas if we had the kids that are in this class taking the initiative to be part of the solution, and how much that will help other people around them join. Yeah, you because know, then they're going to be like, dude, cut off your phone. Here, I, that's all. I think Anna has her hand up. Yeah, Elliot, if you wanted to speak directly to that comment, feel free to go ahead. No, I wanted to. No, I wanted to say something uh, to Matt's point. So. Okay. Um, yeah, I just wanted to uh, bring up the point of equity as well. Um, students who are either um, not allowed to have cell phones yet or financially can't um, uh, afford a cell phone or a smartphone, um, I know are also exposed to a lot of bullying because they don't have uh, this type of device. Um, so there's also a level of equity that we need to be thinking about, you know, as we move forward and in, in taking in all these uh, perspectives. On to you, Elliot. My question is actually on Matt's point about it switching to other electronics. I mean, number one, when I told my kids were 40 years old, they said, oh, they'll just use, you know, you can, they'll just use something, something else. And the question is, what is they doing in other schools that already done this? Are they doing that? Are they texting or emailing using their laptops? I mean, yeah, I mean, that, I think if those communication means are there and student, I mean, I, I'm not, I'm not sure that students in mass are using their one-to-one -one Chromebooks to email parents on a regular basis. I know it, it absolutely happens. I think the concern here is, is kind of the most of the, 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 the open wildness that is the internet and, and um, all of the, the distractions and peer pressures and algorithms that are there that the multiple generations that we serve have been born into and have no other idea. And, and, and now we're beginning to see research, uh, uh, both psychological as well as neurological, that is, is, is that there's no other research to counter available that I'm aware of or that these professionals are aware of. As a professional educator, I'm coming to you. I have an obligation to bring this to you and seek your support. Um, I wouldn't be doing my job otherwise. Josh, so as somebody opposed to this, I feel like to get a really a little bit on two things. One, are you going to have yours? Uh, actually, for the uh, so, uh, so I'm just asking. Yeah, like, as a teacher in general, yeah. faculty member. Mm -hmm. At any level, or yeah. have yours. Yeah. This we expect the staff to also be modeling this for students, uh, and it's part of the the forums and the work that we need to do. But it's really important that the adults and the staff in the building are modeling this as well. We do have some collect questions around uh, two step authentication authentication uh, that we use in this district, and some staff use their personal devices to access work platforms. Uh, so we have to navigate that. There's things to navigate. Uh, for, absolutely, but yeah, there's also, uh, as you can read in one of the resources here, uh, to have administration have access to multiple ways of communicating in the event of emergency has been and continues to be uh, the prevailing wisdom. Uh, so that that shouldn't that shouldn't change either. Next one I was gonna hit you on is that piece of paper I read or did that on purpose. As the person on this board that is. From the law enforcement is going to respond to something that happens in the school. How am I going to know where the person is? So let's just say we had an event that happened like last week in Georgia. Let's hope it never does, but think worst case. How are we going to know where that person is? Your, your students, your information flow. And I went to a, to a training on this a couple of weeks ago for PD that was put on by LSU University. 
That influx information is what gives you a direction to where this person is, so you can make it direct. It's it's a stimulus. It's a sign. That's something to go on. The one in Tennessee was an actual person calling on a cell phone and said, "Person to the library." That was a student on a cell phone in the call. They gave them that direction. I, I'm totally for saying, "Don't have them in a class." Don't have them in class. They go in your bag. They do. They're on silent. They're turned off. But in between classes, or, or you know, so that you know something happens, they have that ability to get to that phone. It's not locked in a lockbox. I think that's a parenting thing. Like, hey, don't pull your phone out. And if I find out you do, I'll take your phone for the day. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that comes back to like the, the parent mm -hmm. raises the kid and should be raising them to know that you be respectful, don't have your phone out. Now, I'm just, I got concerns when it comes to the safety aspect of it. And the, you know, what are we teaching these kids? If the faculty can have it, but the kids can't, that's kind of a bad luck. You know, everybody will be a sheet learner. There's also ways to support those that have medical conditions that may need access to uh, phones that have, uh, you know, tracking for diabetes and such. Absolutely. Absolutely. Have, okay. mm -hmm. have, we have those uh, options as well. And I appreciate your perspective and happy to talk more. And you should join a forum. I hear the district's also investing in and looking at other resources for communication. We've heard one, two different ones this evening. Um, and uh, and again, um, yeah, heartbreaks for those that mm -hmm. lost their lives and loved ones in these things. Yeah, it's just one of those things to pay attention to or think about. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, Heather. Thank you. Um, I'd like to start with a high level of respect and support for the work that Aaron and Sherry have done on this. But I'd like to um, respectfully push back on the idea of the board creating and adopting a policy because policy governance dictates that the board sets ends and executive limitations not means and a policy regarding how this is done oversteps policy governance 3.3 that delegates this to the superintendent we should not be defining means only ends and executive limitations this is a really important topic we should be looking at the procedure but this should not be a policy in my understanding of policy governance. Thank you. Thank you, Heather. Hmm. Oh, yes, sir. Yeah, okay, thank, thank you. you. Any questions? I think, I think we're happy enough. Thank you. Other questions? All right, well, I think we have a lot of work to do, or actually we'll be listening to a lot of work that you're doing. And um, giving you our thoughts, and thank you for the open dialogue. And uh, we look forward to the forums. Sure, thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you. All right, um, we have an authorized a funding of a bond resolution. Jim is going to present to us. Why don't we let um, yeah, we'll let the folks. I know it's going to be earth shattering. Yeah, but I think others have other intentions for tonight. <laughs> <laughs> okay. We're funding bond resolution. Um, in your board packet is the refunding bond resolution, and what what the reason we're bringing this forward is in March of 22, the voters approved and authorized the district to borrow 4.4 million dollars for three projects: the roof project at Killington, the heat system at the high school, and the design of the new middle middle high school. And at that time, acting on the good advice that we had, the board borrowed the funds from Mass Bank. 
In June of 24, the legislature and the governor passed the yield bill that reinstated per student spending thresholds and only excludes bonded debt from that calculation. So the million plus dollars that we're paying every year for the next four years for our loan um, will be not excluded from the per student cost, which will throw us over the limit and you'll have to pay a penalty, which is double the tax on those funds. We have, and I've talked with our bond council and the bond bank, because of the way we wrote the resolution, we have the authority to sell whatever debt the board decides to sell at any time. And so what we're proposing is that we do a refunding bond through the bond bank for the remaining four years of this bond. So we, we can't by law extend it beyond the five years that was authorized by the voters. And that way it'll be excluded from the calculation for the penalty costs. Um, it'll still be part of our calculation for raising taxes, but not for the penalty costs. Um, something that I know Ben will like about this also is by moving our debt payment from July to November, we can reduce our TAN by about a million dollars and save about $60,000 in interest costs every year, which we can also use to offset some of the costs that we have um, have to remove from the budget. So that's a, that's a plus that we weren't thinking of when we did it, but it's a plus that as we're thinking about it now, it's a important. And so what we need to do is have the board pass the resolution authoring us, authorizing us to refund this loan um, through the bond bank. So if someone would make a motion for that, uh, then we can open discussion. I make a motion to follow Jim's guidance to uh, reapply for this loan. Second. Thank you. All right, any discussion, comments, questions? I think I follow you mostly, but. Go ahead, now. Uh, the 60,000 a year on interest you would save by moving from July to November, now, how is it every year that I would say? Because once you move in November, then it's a, the same interest the per 12 months. The reason it's a savings is because the reason it's a savings is because we have to borrow a tax anticipation note every year to cover our short term operating costs until tax revenues come in. Right now, our bond payment or our debt payment is the first week in July. So we have to borrow an extra million dollars to cover that debt payment. But if we wait till November, when we actually have tax revenues, we don't have to borrow that extra million dollars every year for the rest of the loan. Thank you. So it's not it's not savings on this loan, it's a savings on the annual tax anticipation note. Got it, thank you. That was a good question, I didn't get that in. Any other questions? I'll just make a comment. So I, I made this comment at the finance committee meeting, just, I can't tell you how like important this is for our district. If we didn't do this, the, the amount we'd have to cut from our budget to get under excess spending is nearly twice the amount. And so call it twice the positions would have to potentially be eliminated. So this is a total godsend. <laughs> Thank you. No problem. If we didn't have this, I mean, it would be dire. Yeah, it's... It's unfortunate they did what they did, but we fortunately wrote things right so that we can do this now. So, you know, so really they're going to get it back, right? This is only an opportunity to save money. It, it's a positive it. impact because yeah. bond rates are down. So we'll probably get a little lower interest rate than what we're currently paying, but also on our tax anticipation of we can borrow a million less. So it's positive, positive. Right. Are we ready to vote? We will need everybody's signature on the resolution. Okay. <laughs> All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. The resolution has passed. Thanks, Jim, and let us know when you need our signatures. For those of you that are here, I will make sure I get your signatures before you leave. <laughs> <laughs>
Thank you. All right, other folks can stop by perhaps this week to get your signature on the document. Thank you. All right, and now we have a scintillating presentation, I believe. Yes, oh, Adam, sorry. I was just gonna ask, how, how late is the central office open until? Usually 4.30. Usually 4.30. How, how late do you want it to be open to? Yeah. Oh, I, I just know that uh, with middle school high, uh, middle school soccer ending at 4.45, there's a good chance in the next four days I'll be picking up. I'll, I'll, I'll give you an email uh, on a day I might anticipate being able to do it. I, except for tomorrow, because tomorrow's primary day in New Hampshire. Um, I'll be here at 4.45. And, and I'm retired now, so if anyone needs it driven to them, I'm happy to do that. <laughs> Gets me out of the house. <laughs> All right. Um, now we have a scintillating presentation on the audit. You do. Um, <laughs> Raymond, can I uh, share my screen? I think you yes, can do this in are. five minutes, Jim. What do you think? I don't, but I will. Try. <laughs> We won't tell you. I've sat through it once. Big breaths, everybody. A little stretch, a little seventh inning, you know. Take me out to the ball game. Here we go. Okay. <laughs> so I have two audit walkthroughs. Uh, one will take a little longer than the other. Um, what's important is in your package, I have links to the management letters, the full audit, and then my walkthroughs with my notes. Uh, my walkthroughs skip all over the audit, not following it page by page, but I'm highlighting the things that I think are important. I think the things that you want to know. So on the first page, um, the most important, um, the most important thing for you to know is in the opinion of the independent auditor, the financial statements refer to present the, fair, the facts fairly in all material respects. In other words, we did a good job and they don't so. And that's always important because you want to have a what's considered a clean audit or a, a clean opinion, and that's a clean opinion. And to me, that's the most important part of the whole thing. They did have a repeat finding, and this is a repeat finding. This is a second year on this. Um, purchase orders were not used in accordance with our procedures. And we knew this. And the reason we had this finding is because we were really struggling using purchase orders in our old accounting system. On our new accounting system, we phased them in a year ago. Well, well the first six months we were on it. And now nothing gets paid unless the purchase order is used. So we knew we would still not be in compliance in 2023. In 2024, excuse me, in 2024, this finding will go away because we are now in full compliance. But we purposely did not address this because we knew we were going to get the new software that would address it. Okay. Um, moving right along. Two things that I think are important is there's always a, re a restatement. Um, and what this is, is as they do a subsequent year, they might find something that got missed in the prior year's audit and they do a restatement. And so in this particular um, restatement, there was a $29,000 error that was discovered in the 22 audit that they had to restate. Nothing significant, but it's important that you know that it happened. And the other thing that's always important is subsequent events. Um, every year we have to say something that we're aware of that took place after the end of the year, if there was something that is subsequent in nature. For us, it was that the voters of the um, district had approved the loans that we took out last July, a year ago. And those are the things that were noted here in the subsequent event. So not surprised to you, shouldn't be a surprise to the voters, but somebody who's not from our community, uh, this is important for them to know because they're looking at our financials, they're gonna wanna know, you know, next year what we did and how we took care of these things. Okay. One of the things that um, 
is always important to look at is your budget versus actual. And here, our budget for revenues was 21,629, and we actually received revenues of 20,958. <coughs> A um, significant chunk of that was in um, tuition because our tuition estimates were too high and our number of students uh, that were tuitioning in at the high school had dropped. The other one is not a material impact, but as we moved food service out of the general fund into its own fund, we budgeted in the general fund and you'll see later it came in in its own fund. And so that's not really a reduction in revenues is just a shifting to a different fund. How does that help us? It it helps us tracking it independent of the general fund. <clears throat> it doesn't help us in any other way. It really makes accounting for it easier. Okay, when we came to spending, um, our final budget and our actual budget. Uh, we underspent our budget by $334,000 or about one and a half percent. When you think about the fact that we develop our budget and you adopt it in December, six months before the fiscal year starts, that's pretty good budget that we came in with one within one and a half percent of the budget. And that's just, you know, that, that's good, especially that we're under. Okay, one thing that's not so good is our unassigned fund balance. And when you look at the fund balance, there's non-spendable, restricted, committed, assigned, and unassigned. Unassigned is really cash that's available. Um, we were at the end of fiscal year 23, a million four in the hole on unassigned fund balance at the district. Now, hold your comments on that until I get to the SU, and it's not as bad as it looks. But at the district, we are a million four in the hole. And so we have to develop, and I've developed, and we've already recovered a part of that, a strategy to re recover that over the next few years. Okay. Some of the things to keep in mind is in here is your non spendable restricted committed assigned and unassigned and we had 247,000 in non spendable a million three in restricted um the restricted was the money for the JCI project um the million two in assigned and the 1.7 million in available cash as not available <laughs> When you look at our balance sheet, some of the important things to note is that our non-current assets, our capital assets, our buildings, increase in value by $2 million because of the improvements we made. So that was the heating systems that we put in the buildings, the JCI projects, those types of things. Our deferred outflows um, increased a little bit. And our non-current liabilities increase some also. And these are all part of those construction projects. Uh, and so you see in our net position, our net investment in capital increased by two and a half million, our restricted increased by 1.2, and our unrestricted decreased significantly. <clears throat> all that said, our change in net position or profit and loss from our operations was a $539 profit, $539,000 profit. So all this that has some bad stuff, operationally, we did good to the tune of $539,000. So it's not doom and gloom, but there's some things we have to do to be done. Okay, 
one of the things I'm showing you here, and this is part of the reason we separated the food service, is we've known right along for years the food service has operated in the negative somewhere between two hundred and two hundred fifty thousand dollars a year. In 2023, it was $199,000 in the negative. It now shows it because it's a standalone entity. We budget $200,000 a year to offset that. And so it was right on target. So it's not unexpected, but you'll see in the next audit where July 1st, I transferred $199,540 from the general fund of the food service as our transfer to cover the shortfall in food service. And so we were right on target and it was exactly as we expected it to be. If the state pays for all the food for the student, can't we just charge the state? No, because they only pay a, they only pay us so much a kid for so many meals. And the problem is when you have a school with 50 kids or 75 kids or 110 kids, you don't have enough um, business to cover the overhead of running the kitchen. It just seems like a little smoke. I mean, it's not on you. It just seems smoke mirrors to be told that the state's covering meals, but then we're paying for it in our budget out of our taxes to cover mm -hmm. and, a quarter million dollars. Like, it's it's, yeah, got a little, it's a little bit of smoke mirrors. You're right. Yeah. Okay, capital assets. In the notes of the financial statement, they go cover a lot of things that are cover elsewhere and we are, and they give you some of the details. So these are our capital assets, the balances at the beginning of the year, the additions. So you can see building and land improvements, we added 2.6 million and we sold $68,000. Uh, vehicles, we added 92,000, we sold one for 13,000. Um, and then some accumulated depreciation. And so you can see that we did go up a couple million dollars here. And uh, you'll see this again next year um, in the 24 budget because we did all of the um, work at the high school and at Killington. And so those will show up here. Uh, Long-term debt. These are the things that we owe money on. So we owe, at the beginning of the year, we owe $333,000. At the end of the year, we owe $266,000 on the 2010-2014 work that was done at the high school. We have four more years of paying that. And then the $3.1 million at the beginning of the year, that's the JCI project. That's a 15-year debt. And we paid $174,000 against that. And so you can see the detail in the ex explanation there. That's important. Here is the debt schedule for the long-term debt that um, we're showing on the prior page. Some other things that are considered long-term obligations are accrued compensated absences, and net pension liabilities. So an accrued compensated absence <clears throat> is the retirement um, payouts that some of the teachers had that when we merged, that we'll have to pay them when they leave. But this is also some anybody who um, has vacation time or something else that rolls into the new year, that's included in here also. Okay, so those types of leaves are included here. And um, for the uh, retirement payout, because nobody left that was entitled to the payout, the payout amount goes up because, unless they use their sick time because they accrued more sick time and the wages for it. So that's an ever increasing until they leave. The net pension liability is a whole nother story and we'll get to that in a couple of minutes. Okay. So these are your deficit fund balances. You've got your general fund, your food service, capital reserves, Prosper Valley local grant, Veggie Van Gogh, and the after school program. After 
school program is something that we inherited when we merged. And that's something that I'm going to clean up in the next year or so. But it's still right, it's still there right now. So that's goes back to 2016 or 2018, and it's not been addressed yet. Okay. We participate in the Vermont teachers retirement system. And except for teachers that are in grants. We pay nothing towards that retirement. The state pays it directly to the retirement system. But because the retirement system is billions of dollars in the hole, every year they have to distribute out to all of our financials the portion of that deficit that belongs to us. So of the deficit as of June 30th of 2023, $7,666,408 is attributed to us. Now, the good news is if we closed up school at the end of the year, we walk away from that. We're not on the hook for it. Whoever these teachers go to work for would eventually be on the hook for that as they work on their plan to make the retirement system whole. But this is the distribution of the debt that is allocated to us. And it's just an accounting practice. It doesn't mean a whole heck of a lot. For the uh, Beamers, which is Vermont Municipal Employees Retirement, which is what the custodians, the support staff, the kitchen people, people like me who are not in the teachers program, we do pay towards that. And we pay excuse me, about 6% of the wages towards that. Again, that program is also in a deficit position, but not as bad as the teachers. And our allocation of that is $2.2 million. Okay, again, you'll never have to pay it, but that's our allocation. And that is the school district's financial report. Now, what I'd like to do quickly, because I asked you not to ask questions on an other one for a second, is show you a few slides from the SU. So this is the SUR, and I don't want to show you all 30 screens because they're all very similar to what you just saw. What I want to take you to is this screen here where the SU's revenues exceeded the budget by $525,000. So we had a very positive revenues cash flow stream there. Our expenditures were almost right on the money. But our balance sheet shows 
an unassigned fund balance of $2 million. So the deficit we have with the district right now is being offset by the $2 million at the SU. And so part of our plan to fix the, the deficit of the district is to reduce some of the payments that the district makes to the SU over the next two years and draw down the SU's surplus and allow the district to recover some of it. So that's the important thing I wanted to show you that as a complete entity, we're half a million dollars to the good, but as separate entities, one was strong and the other one wasn't. And so part of our financial plan has to be to get that balance back where it needs to be. Okay. Um, there's really nothing else at the SU that I wanted to show you, but if you really want to go through all the slides, they're in your package. So please, you know, go for it. <laughs> Any questions? Jim, great job. Um, I had a chance to ask all of my questions and the finance committee did as well at our last finance meeting. So appreciate you making this mandatory report this evening. <laughs> Yes, and, and I agree. It's been a long time since we've had a comprehensive review of our audit at the board level, and I think this is a really important responsibility because one of the biggest tasks the board has is around the fiscal responsibility and knowing what's in the audit and the books. has got us in trouble a couple times, and I think this has been really helpful. And, and Ron always says he's happy to come if you'd like to have him present. <laughs> yeah. We would not. <laughs> Thank you very much, Jim, for all your hard work. All right. Much appreciated. All right. I think, Sherry, you're going to speak to the grant. So um, I'm really excited to know, and Raph, I thought Raph was going to talk about this project, and Raph thought I was going to talk about this project, but um, we're looking at one of the parts of the strategic plan that really came present after discussions with the community was talking about having multiple pathways for students. How do we ensure that all students have multiple pathways upon graduation? And this is something that was kind of in the last strategic plan. We tried it with different things, really didn't feel like we hit that um, out of the park. So Raph and I talked about offering this course called Future U, which is really looking at um, sophomores in high school and how do we prepare them to make some of the most important decisions they're, they're going to make. College is so expensive. We're asking, you know, really young people to make lifelong decisions and choices about where they want to go, how they want to do that in the process. So um, Raph and I pitched this idea for a class called Future U. Um, we spoke with the Mountain Views Innovation Fund group to the representatives, and they are really excited about this work. Um, we'll give you more information in detail, but Raph and I connected with a professor at Stanford University. He will be um, we got him for a song um, to work with us for three sessions this fall to help us think about how do we help students make these plans. And the uh, um, Mountain Views Innovation Fund will fund $5,000 up to $8,000. Typically, Stanford University is $45,000 a day. And so we are getting this individual for three days for $8,000. Um, and in fact, we met with him today, and the first two of those sessions are supposed to be um, remote, and he is so excited about the collection of people who will be on this that he's like, I could fly out from San Francisco to be part of this group, so maybe I'll come. So we're really excited. Um, typically, this course is only offered at like Stanford and Dartmouth, so college level where kids have already made these life altering decisions. Um, some high schools are looking at it. Typically, those are like Phillips Andover private schools, so we really feel like um, having students have the opportunity to really think about. What are their passions? What are, how do they see themselves making those decisions? Not that they're going to pick a major, but they're going to sign mentors, a lot of different other activities to help them make that decision. Um, and so Mountain View's Innovation Fund has offered a grant of $5,000, and I'm asking the board to accept that gift so we can move forward in this work. Is there a motion to accept the grant? I'll make Sorry. a motion to accept the grant. Oh, I can second if need be. Second. It, it really don't matter. It makes sense. Ryan made the motion. I'm going to second it. All in favor? I, 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 I agree. Any opposed? 
But okay. is he really coming here to see the people or the trees? He, I guess, I mean, Rap and I got out for a 30 minute call at 3.30 and he just got a public high school in central Vermont, wants to do this work. He is so excited. And I, I think that again, why should you have to go to Philip St. Andrew to have this experience? Our students should have that opportunity. So he's, a, he's really excited. He said great stuff's happening in Vermont and I would agree. You're here. Great. All right, now we are going to the committee uh, updates and finance committee. Oh, Adam, sorry, I didn't see you. I, I um, was just gonna, uh, yeah, I was just gonna applaud uh, the our district's ability to kind of reach beyond the small state of Vermont for expertise is pretty commendable, right? So who Sherry just referenced, but then um, good on you, Aaron, of getting the chief science officer from the APA to be a consultant to us about uh, the use of smartphones. That's pretty impressive. And, and, and RAF leveraging MIT contacts. Yeah. Let's figure out AI. All right, great, great work for all. Thank you. Um, ben, Finance Committee. Yeah, Finance uh, met in August. Uh, we went over the audit. We uh, went over a few other, like the um, um, the conversion of the outstanding debt to uh, to a bond. And um, also wanted to thank um, Sherry, uh, Jim, others who were involved in a really good discussion about um, getting kids to after school care uh, in Reading uh, to the Albert Bridge School and the flexibility that we were able to uh, employ to uh, to be able to support that important program. But um, yep, yeah, we'll meet again next week. And um, we'll, the, the I think the important work of the committee is around you know how we're going to uh, bring a budget forward, right, um, to the to the board to you know for next year recognizing these kind of surprise limitations um, with the excess spend threshold that we talked about, um, you know, a, a bit ago. And that's going to be a process. Unfortunately, that work needs to be done in executive session because it impacts employment contracts. And I know that's frustrating for a lot of members in the public who have, you know, the interest that they're, you know, seeking to uh, protect uh, or to, to see heard. But we would encourage people to um, certainly make their voices known and we'll share as much information as we can before we get into budget season. Thank you. Uh, policy committee update. So we have no updates uh, this evening. Uh, the policy committee has not had a quorum meeting for several months, and uh, that basically so we haven't been able to move things ahead. We are hoping next week that we will be able to have a quorum meeting. Um, we do have several students uh, that are sort of on deck and are um, in our draft form that we could work on. So we're hoping. Thank you. Uh, buildings and grounds. All right. Um, we did meet. Uh, Joe's here. I'm going to highlight some of the work Joe and his team did over the summer. Um, so there was some painting of all the trim at Killington Elementary School that was finished. Um, the alarm system which works perfectly fine today, but the fire inspector would want the heat detectors update, updated. Those have not arrived, so we're waiting for those parts before we can repair that system. Um, delayed some work on some insulation, but we're planning to do it in April above the, the wall between the gym and the school at Killington. At Woodstock, uh, there were some tree house repairs made where there was some rot. Uh, three classrooms have new carpet, um, we explored replacing the, the lift between the second and third floor, but the fire marshal didn't like our proposal, so we're looking at the possibility of adding an elevator in, this, in the back stairwell. Uh, at Reading Elementary, uh, the parking lot and the entrance with like, the drop-off for the buses and parents was completely repaved and reconfigured, and, and I've heard from the public that that was very well received and a job very well done. And at Reading, we had a big HVAC prop project that was under grants. Uh, so we upgraded um, all of the air handling systems with new heat pumps that include air conditioning. So we, we already have a super efficient um, heating system there, but now we're going to be able to supplement that with some heat pumps. So I think um, Reading is going to sort of set the bar now on an energy efficient building for us. 
Um, at Prosper Valley, uh, the back parking lot was repaired and the H2 bottle fillers are being repaired as we speak. They're in. They're in. Um, and here at this building, the supervisory union building, um, the building was painted and we're exploring a new door access system that could be used district wide, but that didn't quite go in. Um, and then to finish off with the high school, middle school, um, the, the, the biggest news by far is that we did sign off on what's called substantial completion under the contract with JCI and they, they are installing all the heating control systems. And so, um, fingers crossed, when we turn the heat all back on, we're going to have temperature control dialed in in all of our classrooms. Yes. Um, <laughs> the answer is yes. Uh, and the, the, the boiler repairs were done, you know, the entire project to convert to hydronic heating away from those old systems we had, that that's all completed. I think the boiler might need one more item. Yeah, there'll be a, a slight repair that's going to take place in October. Okay, so the last thing on my list, and it's probably the most important that we discussed tonight, uh, is the status of the the gymnasium at the high school. So our, our committee um, dove into a recent engineering report on the, the loading capacity of that roof. Um, so we, we engaged Dubois and King, they're an engineering firm, and they came on site and they assessed uh, the joist and they observed all the joists to be in perfectly good working condition. They saw nothing wrong with the, the joists that are there. Um, but when they ran their calculations on what the snow loading, what the roof loading would be with those joists, um, they drew a, a conclusion, which is, which is that uh, they were designed for 30 pounds per square foot, and that met the code in 1956 when this building was constructed. However, in 2015, the current code would require that that roof handle 46 pounds per square foot feet, so 16 pounds per square feet. Uh, so we're not at today's code for roof loading on the gymnasium. The, the, other, re, the other areas of uh, concern that they noticed was that there's some cracking in the masonry. So you know that that's a cinder block wall, anyone who's familiar with the gym. And in between the mason, masonry is concrete mortar. And in some spots, it's cracked. Sometimes it's a vertical crack. Other places, it's a step crack where it like follows the actual cinder block. And they are not, in their report, they didn't draw any conclusions as to why those cracks are there. Is it loading or is it something else? And they, they actually think it's most likely uh, what they call, refer to as shrinkage, like the mortar is just sort of dried out and now you're starting to see some cracks. So what they recommended is that anywhere we see cracks in those walls, we repoint the mortar and then we paint it and then we monitor it every six months. So watch for any additional changes to those repointed crack. If, if, if nothing happens, then that would probably mean that what caused all the cracking was shrinkage and not them you know, failing under, under stress. Um, so we're, we're gonna do that. I don't know if it's done yet, but- Oh, we, we have that on a schedule now that we're open and things are getting back to normal. So we'll repoint the, the cracks that you can see in the walls and paint them and then monitor them every six months. They also advised us to the joists, the big steel beams run east to west, if you're familiar with the gym. But then north to south, they have something called angle X brackets that support those joists. And then when they come up on the north-south wall, they make contact with the wall still as an X. And they think that that caused some like uh pressure that may have caused one of the cracks so they're they're recommending we replace those when they rejoin the wall with straight two straight uh steel rods instead of a of an x so we've asked as a building and ground committee that we get a quote to see what that would cost yeah i should have a proposal for uh reinforcing the uh choice for that ceiling which will bring us up the code and alleviate any of the issues that they had noted uh, I should have that by the end of October. And then the last thing I'll point out is that they also recommended that we implement snow management where if over 16 inches is on the roof, you get up and you remove the snow. But that is completely not 
uh, feasible because that entire gym is surrounded by lower level buildings. And so we would have no place to put it. Um, and they advised uh, against trying to melt it and drain it. So, um, you know, I bring this to the full board's attention because, you know, the fear is that would that roof collapse under heavy load? I mean, it's been there for 70 years and has not, uh, but there was like, I think five years ago, there was a lot of snow and rain and, and someone thought they heard groaning or noise in the beams. Um, but so again, you draw your own conclusions. It doesn't meet today's code. It the, the cracking, they can't say for sure is the stress loading. We're gonna we're gonna fix those cracks and monitor them, and we're gonna get a price to potentially strengthen the beams to bring it up to code. But at this time, our committee was not recommending to close the gym. That's and that's the full buildings and grounds. That was our whole meeting. Five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a good fit up them actually. <laughs> Closing the gym. All right. Um, negotiations, hiring, and retention committee update. Uh, this fall, negotiations will need to start with the support staff. <clears throat> and we're waiting for a date for the arbitration on the, the one matter that uh, could not be resolved. Any other working groups? Oh, all right. Then the next thing we need to do is approve the minutes from August 5th, 2024. Assuming you've had a chance to look at it. Um, did anyone find anything to uh, correct? All right, is there a motion to approve the minutes? Very important motion. My motion. <laughs> Thank you, Josh. Is there a second? second. Thank you. All in favor of approving the minutes, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you. It's approved. Um, and now uh, we have an opportunity for public comment. What I'd like to say is that um, I'd like to keep it to two minutes per person due to the hour that we're at. Um, if somebody has already said what you were going to say, it's perfectly okay to say, I was going to say that, but I'm not going to. Um, and um, we open it up now for public comment. Yes. Hi, I'm Elizabeth Presswoya, um, parent in the district, and I uh, had three quick comments. One to speak to the um, future you idea which I just learned about. Um, there's also Advance Vermont, which is a great organization that helps with career aspiration choices. So something that's sort of put to the next advancedvermont.org, I think. Um, I wanted to just speak briefly in support of the um, idea that Aaron is um, proposing around uh, the cell phone uh, discussion, especially including youth voice. I'm really grateful that you're including youth voice in that. I support the ban. Um, and I also think that there's a lot of discussion to be had to um, make sure that that is the right choice and that everyone feels that their voices are heard in that discussion. Um, and finally, to speak to what um, Elizabeth Reeves mentioned at the beginning of the meeting, um, I went to this school. I attended all of the, <laughs> all of the Woodstock schools in the year. And music was the thing that was the most important to me um, and helped me learn to focus and helped me learn to work with people and to listen. And that's not what I'm doing. I mean, I did some music, but it's helped me in every aspect of my life. And so I just want to like put in a little, little word that the arts, Spanish, you know, other languages, STEM. STEM is what my kid is like. He's like, I won't go to vacation with you if I'm going to miss STEM, right? Like that's what he's living for. So like, how can we make sure that those things are really crucial and critical parts of what we want for our community? So that's what I was saying. Thank you. Anybody else? We can't, we can't see very well. Anybody online? All right, this is your last chance. Yes. <clears throat> Um, I also want to speak and just say that um, that we owe it to our kids to provide these guardrails because um, the parents, the teachers, you know, the kids policing themselves is not working. So I'm so thrilled to hear that we're engaging in these conversations with the phone free. That's amazing. 
and um, that we're joining a statewide and worldwide movement to really give our kids the best, um, you know, kids school is for social socializing and critical thinking. And, and we, we have to give our kids this, it's a gift. Um, Your name in town is? Sarit Warner, Woodstock, Vermont. Um, and with respect to AI and bringing that into the schools, I'm just wondering, um, does that apply also to the elementary school and, and middle school, or is it just a high school thing? So the uh, Brad can speak to that. Permissions can only be given to students in grade at 13 and older. Eighth grade. Eighth grade. Thank you. Good question. Yeah. Um, Brad, can you speak to that? But we should give it to the teachers everywhere. <laughs> Anybody else? All right. Well, thank you very much. Um, as a board, we uh do not have an executive session tonight we do have an opportunity for reflection so i'm interested in your reflection and i do have a couple of comments to make about a meeting i attended today board members Carrie. yes i hope we're that public i don't want to hold us up anymore but there's like a shit storm we don't know about the varsity soccer woman that I'd like to touch base on that. I think we'll we'll talk afterwards. very rare. Why don't, why don't we talk afterwards? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Any other comments for reflection? What we did well, what we can do better? Well, I did want to let you know that I attended a commission meeting on public education today. It was three hours. Um, and uh, they did a lot of talking and acknowledging that um, they didn't have a very diverse representation of people on their committee. Um, and they may reach out to find other folks who actually are teaching and or administrating in um, the various districts. And um, I did make a public comment um, around two things. I said, first of all, um, you know, we're in the second worst rated school in the state and at 90% depletion. We can't renovate it. And um, now with the yield bill putting in uh, limits and penalties, we are really at our wits end as to what to do. And uh, we'll be, we are hoping that you have some thoughts on that and, and fixing that as soon as you can. And then I also went on and said, and I also would like to know what is, does the ed fund actually fund? Because I recently learned and very, you know, validated by our business manager that the TIF districts in our state are being financed out of the ed fund. And of course they do what we do. They said, thank you. Um, and um, then um, Ken Fredette, who I know Ben's talked to, who's a, has a, a group called, um, Friends of Public Schools, I think. And he also got up and read a much more eloquent um, letter, but he did reference the TIF district and he, he actually acknowledged me and said thank you to me for mentioning that because he said the deficit that the, the state had to bail out, which was $60 million um, to offset, I forget what now, I did know once. Um, he said that would have been probably the TIF district down the road in Killington would have probably more than paid for that. So it was interesting. Um, there were other speakers as well who spoke about some of the things that we have also had problems with regarding penalty phase, when it was implemented, how it was implemented, and so forth and so on. So I sent out to you today the link to those meetings, should any of you feel like using your time that way. It, well, I almost say it was boring, but you can have your camera off so you can multitask in the background. Okay, anyone else? All right, is there a motion to adjourn? Josh has motioned it. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. All right, all in favor of adjourning, say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? All right, we'll meetings next week. Thank you.